Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Judge Jackson, welcome. You are indeed to be congratulated and your entire family with you, and thank you for your time to visit. I appreciated so much that. And to your daughters, her best job is being mama. She likes that one. And, uh, but we've talked today a little bit about the momentous occasion that this is and bringing you forward, and indeed it is, because Unlike any other federal office, this is a lifetime appointment. And the decisions that you're going to make are going to impact rights and freedoms of every single American citizen. And, you know, President Biden thinks you're the right person for the job. But it doesn't end there. We do have that role of advice and consent. And it is up to us to carry that job out. So as you have heard repeatedly, this is going to be a fair and very thorough and very respectful hearing. And we're going to work through this process with some tough questions, but do it in a manner, the respect that you deserve. And we've talked some today about the treatment of Justice Thomas and Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, Justice Barrett, who was questioned about her faith and whether that made her suitable for the court. And I know your faith is important to you. We've also talked some about uh, Janice Rogers Brown and the treatment that she endured here. So we are going to be pleased to move forward and focus on the issues that the American people want to focus on because they want to know about you and how you're going to approach your job and the decisions that you have made in the past, what you've written, what you have said. And I've got a few areas that I'm going to want to delve a little bit further with you. And we touched on some of these as we talked. Right now, when I talk to Tennesseans, one of the most important things that they bring up is the issue of parental rights and wanting to be able to rear their children as they see fit. And moms and dads are very concerned about this progressive agenda that is being pushed in some of our public schools. Educators are allowing biological males to steal opportunities from female athletes in the name of progressivism. Just last week, an entire generation of young girls watched as those charged with protecting them allowed a biological male to compete and beat a biological woman at the highest level of collegiate sports. Some girls have been forced to share locker rooms with biological males. Rather than defending our girls, those in power are teaching them that their voices don't matter. They're being treated like second-class citizens. And Americans need a Supreme Court justice who will protect our children and will defend parents' constitutional right to decide what is best for their own kids. And here we need a little clarity at a time when these parental rights appear to be under assault by the radical left, your public comments about, and I'm going to quote you, the transformative power of progressive education, end quote. These are deeply concerning. You serve on the board of a school that teaches kindergartners, five-year-old children, that they can choose their gender and teaches them about so-called white privilege. This school has hosted an organization called Woke Kindergarten and pushes an anti-racist education program for white families. Your public endorsement of this type progressive indoctrination of our children causes one great concern when it comes to how you may rule on cases involving parental rights. Parents also know that it's only a matter of time before we have the next pandemic, and they're concerned about more mask mandates or lockdowns from unelected bureaucrats that would harm their children's mental health and stunt their development. The American people want a Supreme Court justice who will protect their families' freedoms, 
not allow government overreach into private family decisions. Now, moms that I'm speaking with raise the issue of crime, and you've consistently called for greater freedom for hardened criminals. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, you advocated, and again, I quote, for each and every criminal defendant in the D.C. Department of Corrections custody should be released. That would have been 1,500 criminals back on the street if you had had your way. And you use the COVID-19 pandemic as justification to release a fentanyl drug dealer, a bank robber addicted to heroin, and a convict who murdered a U.S. Marshal into our communities. But your efforts to protect convicts began long before the pandemic. You used your time and talent not to serve our nation's veterans or other vulnerable groups, but to provide free legal services to help terrorists get out of Gitmo and go back to the fight. You also have a consistent pattern of giving child porn offenders lighter sentences. On average, you sentence child porn defendants to over five years below the minimum sentence recommended by the sentencing guidelines. And you have stated publicly that it is a mistake to assume that child pornography offenders are pedophiles. Your philosophy, it appears, is backward on these issues. Restrictions on children and families and freedom for criminals. In fact, your philosophy, or lack thereof, may be the root of the problem here. I was concerned during our conversation earlier this month when you told me that you really didn't have a judicial philosophy. The American people deserve a Supreme Court justice with a documented commitment to the text of the Constitution and the rule of law, not a judicial activist who will attempt to make policy from the bench. Without a judicial philosophy, a judge is legally adrift and will be inclined to consider policy rather than law. You once wrote that every judge has, and I quote, personal hidden agendas, end quote, then influence how they decide cases. So I can only wonder, what's your hidden agenda? Is it to let violent criminals, cop killers, and child predators back to the streets? Is it to restrict parental rights and expand government's reach into our schools and our private family decisions? Is it to support the radical left's attempt to pack the Supreme Court? You have praised the 1619 Project, which argues the U.S. is a fundamentally racist country, and you have made clear that you believe judges must consider critical race theory when deciding how to sentence criminal defendants. Is it your personal hidden agenda to incorporate critical race theory into our legal system? These are answers that the American people need to know. So we are going to look at past statements and decisions and seek clarification from this committee before we make our decisions. So let me close again by congratulating you on your impressive career and your nomination to the nation's highest court. Regardless of the outcome of the confirmation process, you and your family should be incredibly proud of all that you have achieved. Your story is a wonderful example of the American dream fulfilled. You are able to sit here today because you were reared and built your career in a free country whose laws protect equal justice and opportunity for all to ensure that future generations can expect the same blessings and opportunities you receive, we need justices who will be dedicated to justice and the rule of law. Our questions to you over the coming days are going to be tough, but they're tough by necessity because it is our duty to discern, determine whether you will, first and foremost, uphold the Constitution and our nation's founding principles. Thank you so much for joining us.